Brendan Gray. The book of Exodus talks a lot about the journey from slavery of the Hebrews in Egypt, working their way across the Sinai Desert and eventually getting to the Promised Land. They have been slaves for many, many, many years, maybe centuries. All they knew was living that life, but as awful as it was, they had shelter, they had food. When they went out into the desert after, they, after being through the Red Sea, they found that they didn't have, when they ran out of the food they carried, what do we do? And so God provided manna and quail for protein. Sorry they didn't have beef. And uh, that went for quite a while, for many years. But as they're going through this barren land, and if you've seen pictures of the Sinai Peninsula, it's pretty desolate. A lot of sand and rock and mountains. And pretty inhospitable. Well, you can go quite a while without food. Several weeks, possibly. But a person can only go a handful of days without water. And so as they're going through this wilderness, they no longer have a water source. And so we hear the community complaining to Moses, we're thirsty, what are you going to do about it? And Moses says, ah! The whole Israelite community broke camp and set out from the Sin Desert to continue their journey as the Lord commanded. They set up their camp at Raphidium, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people argued with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why are you arguing with me? Why are you testing the Lord? But the people were very thirsty for water there, and they complained to Moses, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They're getting ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go ahead of the people and take some of Israel's elders with you. Take in your hand the shepherd's rod that you used to strike the Nile River and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock of Horeb. Get the rock and water will come out of it. And the people will be able to drink. Moses did what, while Israel's elders watched. He called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites argued with and tested the Lord asking, is the Lord really with us or not? They were looking back. As awful as slavery was, at least they knew what tomorrow would bring. Again, they had food, they had water. Yes, it was a tough life, but they were used to it, if you ever could get used to that life. And now, God is trying to teach them not to look back, but to look ahead. We're going to take you to the promised land, but we've got to get you squared away so you're looking ahead. And part of what comes up a little later are the Ten Commandments. The rules, the law, and how to live in relationship with God. Trust God. And here we hear them grumbling instead of praying to God, help us. It's Moses, it's all your fault. You're trying to kill us. Pretty, I think, a lot of human nature in what they're behaving. We're in a desert now, or a wilderness, with this coronavirus situation. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We don't know what, who's going to be affected, what, whatever. But even in the darkest of days, we're still to trust God's providence. Like the Israelites, or the Hebrews, did not do here, we are to tr trust God that he will provide. Now, that doesn't mean doing foolish things. But, you know, there are a lot of precautions that each of us can take, and we need to do those, and to do the right things, and take care of ourselves. 
but ask God for help and guidance. Look ahead. Let it all be over. Look forward, not backward. Now, when they were getting water in the wilderness, they wanted fresh water. They didn't want water that had been stagnant and laid in pools. But after all, if you have a pool of water, what all has been growing in it? A lot of things that people don't, don't are not good for the people. But they want water that's moving, that's fresh, living water. Hmm. That sounds like the lead into our gospel text from the fourth chapter of John. If you remember last week, we had third chapter of John with the Nicodemus coming to visit Jesus in the middle of the night in the darkness. Now we have a contrast. Jesus is in a Samaritan village. He meets a Samaritan woman. And horror of horrors, he talks to her. Now, a Jewish man should not be talking to a Samaritan woman. But Jesus has no boundaries. He, she, too, is a child of God and became a disciple. And this is a long reading. But it's a fascinating story of how Jesus interacts and where Nicodemus didn't understand Jesus, this unnamed Samaritan woman gets it. She gets who Jesus is. And I'll read the first two, four or three verses just as a lead in. Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was making more disciples and baptizing more than John, although Jesus is disciples were baptizing, but not Jesus himself. Therefore he left Judea and went back to Galilee. Then we start with verse 4. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. The Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me? A Samaritan woman. For Jews and Samaritans did not associate with each other. Jesus responded, if you recognize God's gift and who is saying it, give me some water to drink. You would be asking him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you do not have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us this well and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become, in those who drink it, a spring of water that bubbles into, up into eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me some of this water so that I may never be thirsty and will never need to come back here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go, get your husband, and come back. The woman replied, I do not have a husband. <clears throat> you are right to say I do not have a husband, Jesus answered. You have had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. You have spoken the truth. The woman said, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. But you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship with what you do not know. We worship what we know, because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming, and is here, when true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. The Father looks for those who worship him in this way. God is spirit and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. 
The woman said, I do. I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ, and when he comes, he will teach us everything. Jesus said to her, I am. I am the one who speaks to, with you. Just then, Jesus' disciples arrived and were shocked that he was talking to with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking to her? The woman put down her water jar and went into the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who has told me everything I have done. Could this man be the Christ? They left the city and they were on their way to see Jesus. In the meantime, the disciples spoke to Jesus saying, Rabbi, eat. Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples asked each other, has someone brought us some food? Jesus said to them, I am fed by doing the will of the one who sent me and by completing his work. Do not you have a saying, four more months and then it's time for harvest? Look, I tell you, open your eyes and notice that the fields are already ripe for harvest. Those who harvest are receiving their pay and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that those who sow and those who harvest can celebrate together. This is the true saying that one sows and another harvests. I have sent you to harvest what you did not work for, hard for, others have worked hard, and you will share in their hard work. Many Samaritans in that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word when she testified. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word, and they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, but we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. May God bless our hearing of his holy word. The Samaritans and the Jews were like this. You had the southern kingdom of where Jerusalem is located in Judah. Above that is Samaria, and above that is Galilee. Most Jews would not go to Samaria. They did not even want Samaritan dust on their feet. And they would go on the east side of the Jordan River, which is farther, it took longer to get back and forth, but we didn't get contaminated with with them. And there's a lot of things in their history that led to this uh, split. But as you hear, there's nothing that's being done to bring them together. We have to maintain a dislike of, you know, that group over there. But Jesus breaks down boundaries. One, and those that culture, even if he was in Jerusalem, a man did not speak to a woman who was unaccompanied by her husband. That was a no-no. Let alone a Samaritan woman. And yet he talks to her. What does that tell us? Is there anybody that we should not be in contact with if the opportunity presents itself? Who is outside of God's love? I don't think there is anybody. And so Jesus meets this unlikely woman. She's had five husbands. Can you imagine the suffering that she has had? Now, some people want to say that she has not been a very good person, but if you notice, Jesus at no time said, go and sin no more. We've talked different times about a Leverite marriage where if a woman does not have a son, husband dies, he marries his brother, he dies, he marries the next brother, da 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 da. But the idea of having a son giving credit back to the original dad, the husband. Does that ever happen? We don't know. But it wasn't that she was a bad person just that she was very unfortunate. Would have suffered much harder. And through her brokenness, she found hope. She found hope in God. 
hope in Jesus. John, the, the author of this text, is trying to explain to oops, his uh, readers why God reaches out to other people. Jesus is not just for the Jews, but he's for the world. If he can be for the Samaritans, he can be for anybody. He can be living water, the free need of us spiritually. A while back, we were at a, a Cracker Barrel restaurant, and this sign, this little block caught my attention. You are loved. Doesn't that pretty well describe what Jesus says? To each one of us, you are loved. You will have that someplace where you can see it. I don't even remember what town we were in, but if I travel, who knows, whatever. But Cracker Barrel does have some a fun gift shop. And they make sure you go through it on your way to the dining area. Jesus is the living water. Now we have to have water, or maybe some of you have to have coffee. I'm not mentioning any names, but, but it's the idea that we have to have that liquid for our bodies to function. When we're baptized, we consider that we're baptized in holy water. And we're just, the living water is that spiritual nourishment that is in each of us. That we have to keep our souls fed, watered, nourished. And that the living water that Jesus provides does that for each and every one of us. That we can go out of this church this morning with confidence that God is with us. He is in our hearts. He is leading our wherever we're headed. And he is with us no matter the ups and downs of life. And so change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true that we are with him now and forever. A reminder that the cross made that an eternal thank goodness.